But we'll kick off and I'm going to come to Jack first. One of the questions that came in from Jake Hartley, which was around planning and periodization, but in particular, maximizing training time when contact is limited. And I guess anyone that's on this call who works in the academy or anywhere in team sports, let alone just football, has that issue. When time is limited, you've got everything to fit in. You've got technical coaches wanting to get out on the pitch uh, and, and have their have their piece of the pie. How do you guys at Liverpool, how do you maximise train the physical training time that you have? Yeah, um, I think there's a couple of key things, really. I think you've got to have good communication and with the coaches so that you've got an integrated football programme, which will hopefully um, achieve a lot of the physical sort of outcomes that you're wanting in terms of you can get physical development through the football drills as well. Um, but then it really comes down to knowing what the priorities are for each player. So if you've only got a limited amount of time, you don't want to be spending time on because you feel like you need to do everything. You know, there's a lot of different training methodologies out there, um, loads of equipment, etc. And, you know, if the player's goal is that he needs to improve his coordination, that's going to help him technically. Then really that's where you know, you need to focus more of your time. If you've got a really good technical player, but he struggles to stay on the pitch, he's not particularly robust, and he's got a, he's got poor strength around his hips, for instance, then really prioritise that area. So I think it's about understanding what the players need, um, prioritising that, then agreeing that with the coach as well, because as well as having a good integrated football programme, you can also potentially, if there's individual work going on, with a football coach, he might be doing unit work, we might be doing some technical work. He may then want that player, you know, it may be agreed to actually come over to the, the fitness coach and you'd be able to get some time back within the actual football session if it really is a big priority for that player. I think fitness coaches as well, the warm-up, you know, we can we can really individualise that as well if you want, depending on the age and, you know, the type of player you're working with, a uh, type of coach you're working with. Um, you know, we had a fitness coach here who... Uh, your, your bucket players, obviously. Um, within the warm up, we had three different types of warm ups all going on. So they'd all follow a pretty general sort of dynamic movement um, warm up, but then they might go into specific mechanics drills. So it may be an acceleration group, a deceleration group, and a more basic sort of agility footwork sort of group. And that was what they did um, twice a week out of the four. They had an individualized based warm up. So that's another option. Um, I think what you have to do as well when you're looking at the priorities of the player is really work back from the pitch. And that's where you'll get a good relationship with the coach as well, as long as you're always talking that language and you're looking at what that player is doing on the pitch, uh, rather than really delving into force platform numbers or isometric mid dipole. you know, you're just getting further and further away from the game. So that, that would be my advice. And then finally, I suppose COVID has shown us as well. And again, depends on the player, but there's also possibilities to provide um, homework away from the training ground uh, if necessary, as long as it's not too taxing. It might just be additional mobility, flexibility work. It might be some control work. And um, there's obviously different software out there which enables us to track that. Um, and again, just builds a good relationship with the player. They understand that you're trying to do what's best for them. Sorry, going a bit further down the age groups, we've had parents come in as well. And we've explained to them in a, in a big group center as part of the the parents curriculum um, that we will provide individual programs for players to do at home as well um, and you get the buy-in from the parents as well in that feel free to jump in guys whenever you feel comfortable but in the, in that warm-up jack for those out there that maybe don't have multiple coaches that can go out and and facilitate them yeah various that, groups is that just one coach that's just one okay coach. okay so, yeah that's just one coach the football coaches are around it um, but yeah, you know, I mean, that's the big thing about coaching, you know, obviously you're going to pick certain players, but you know what you're looking for. So the cue you're giving one player will be different to another. They might all be doing the same drill, but what they're working on will be individual to them. So I think, yeah, it's more than capable. You just got to position yourself right. And, you know, you might prioritize one warm up with one station more so, mm -hmm. and, you know, you can just work your way through, um, yeah, so you don't need multiple coaches for, for that. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks, mate. Thing, well, just, just quickly is, um, obviously, we've all got smartphones. And again, you know, some 
people might be conscious. We, we do it a lot in the athletic development work in the gym pre-training, but we'll film a lot of this work and it's great feedback for the players for them to visually see what you're asking them to do. But you can also use, yeah, the analyst can do that. So if you're coaching, you could ask the analyst or another member of staff, maybe the physio or the coach, just to hold an iPhone and concentrate on a couple of players. And then you can get into further detail later down the line. Interesting. Perry, yeah, anything, I, to, anything to add, yeah. mate? Yeah, sorry. I was just going to jump in and say, I think, um, I think one, of the, one of the main things is, you know, because we're on this developmental pathway, we need to realise as coaches and practitioners that you're not going to get um, massive changes in short periods of time. We know we're under time constraints. Um, so it's about chipping away over a longer period of time and hoping that you see the changes over that longer period. You know, for coaches in those situations, you're not going to get those instant changes. Um, but about it's about hitting those big rocks consistently, like Jack was saying, and, and having a plan and objective. Um, you know, if, you, if you've got objectives for your, your warm up and, you know, you can call them warm ups or athletic development sessions. But either way, you know, you, you have objectives for those. But, you know, exactly what, what Jack was saying there, it's, it's about um, it's about hitting the big rocks consistently. But I think, um, yeah, definitely realising that you're not going to change someone overnight but over a season over two seasons over three seasons you know mechanics might get better speed will get faster that type of um adaptation i'll come to you in a second matt just one thing for perry then big rocks that you mentioned what would they be if you're able to communicate that us, 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 you know if you want to break it down into crude elements and let's say you've got i don't know only two or three um blocks of time on the pitch with them before they go into their session one would be for us linear focused. So it'd be, you know, you might work on acceleration for six weeks and then lengthen it out a little bit. Or um, another day would be your change of direction slash agility. And another day might be more mobility and functional movement based, depending on the age group. So I think if you were to hit those three consistently through the, you know, the early youth development phases, and then, you know, you had objectives for each session within each block, then I think over time you're going to see those changes. Cool. Thanks, mate. Matt, anything to add? Just riding on the back of what Jack said, to be honest, I think we're three people that are quite um, fortunate to have at Liverpool, Arsenal and Tottenham so many staff around us, like physical development staff. But going back or rewinding when I first come to the club, like 11 years ago, it's just basically me being a one man band, which essentially is, you know, what a lot of people I imagine on here can relate to. And it's like, well, how can you include the coach? How can you include the coach? Exactly what Jack's saying there to get um, the outcomes that you want. So not only does it give you another voice within your physical development session, it obviously can bring buy-in from all the players as well, which is huge. So the more the players buy into what you're doing, obviously the more outcome you get. And I think the closer the coach is to you and the closer you are together, then the more the players are buying to what you're doing, then the more you can relate it to football. Um, so, yeah, so kind of maximising training time when, when you kind of contact time is limited, I think is yeah on the pitch really important, but also in the gym, the same thing what Jack said there, I think it's really good. Like, don't do all the trimmings, don't do all the S&C trimmings, like releases, stretching, all that. I think just anything they can do away from the training centre, just leave it for away from the training centre. Uh, COVID, yeah, has made us experts in that now. Um, and all, all the players, you know, experts in doing stuff on their own at home. They've all got equipment and space and all that they can do stuff in. Um, but yeah, it's, it's yeah. I, I, I think that really struck a chord what Jack said there. I think having carousels that you can do on the pitch to get the same physical outcomes really important. If you haven't got people around you, then use the coach and use whoever you've got with you taking that session. So you mentioned a few things there, Matt, of what you would leave for the lads to do at home. Is there anything specifically that you would say, this is always done at home now? With our school boys, releases, low level stretching, um, IP programs, you could say, things like Proprio and all that. I think uh, th there's a lot of things that they can do while they're at home. Like, you know, you can send someone off with a mini band and they can do loads of different things with, with that. Um, I just think, what we've had this year, and that's what I can relate to, to be honest, I can really relate to this question, that we, we haven't had day release this year. So our 14s get dropped off. Well, let's say our 16s, even our 16s, they get dropped, dropped off at the side of a pitch. They haven't even come in the building. They've gone onto the pitch. We've done our s &C work by the side of the pitch or, you know, with the coach, within the warm-up. We've done the strength work after. 
like by the side of the pitch with a, you know body weight, a few kettlebells, purple bands, things like that. You can you can get by. Um, and I think to to make it more punchy, I think it also helps more buy-in that if you prolong a session and you've got all the, you know, your releases and mobility and activation and all that before you actually get to the punchline of the whole session, the outcome, they're already sick of your voice for the last 20 minutes. And I think actually this year's, we've, we've, all our lads are physically developed. We've got the same outcome, but we haven't used all the technology that we had. Um, you know, we, we've, I think it's found a way to, to normalize or bring at the SNC community and the practice back to a level where we were maybe five, six, seven years ago before the technology boom. And so it's now allowed us to kind of step back and pick the bits of technology that we think truly helps what we do. Um, if Jack gets in a piece of kit at Liverpool, I want to know about it and I want to give it a go. And if Perry gets in a bit piece of kit at Arsenal, I want to give it a go. But that, that was my thinking a, f- a couple of years ago. But now I think it's like, well, no, what are our beliefs? What do we believe in? what is the shortest period of time we can get that delivery in um, and then do we get some benefit from it? And obviously that's where your testing and stuff comes in. And I think this year has actually been really good for that. Is there anything that you can tell us, Matt, that you've moved away from in terms of people love a tech chat on tech and what, what people are implanting and what people aren't anything that's been binned. Um it, things have been been for different age groups. I, I, okay. I like for, for some things that we've um, stopped using for the younger age groups, we've we've used more of in the older age groups, or we kept we kept it going. Um, technology obviously comes in whenever we test, light gates, things like that. But you know, things like nor boards and force frames and all that kind of like, do we really need to do that with our younger age groups? You know what I mean? I I, I just think um, good simple practice with logical progressions, with thought out and progressive SNC programs, you're gonna get improvements. So it doesn't really need the opt to jump every second day to see how, how you know how much somebody's improving and things like that. I just think just periodically put it in where it's where it's impactful and where we need it. But until then, just you use good practice and good logical thinking and, and apply the right things to the right people at the right time. And I think that takes experience, not necessarily um, a degree in data analysis and, and all that kind of data that we, we collect every day. Anything been binned at Liverpool and Arsenal that maybe pre-COVID was a bit of a staple? Um, I wouldn't say that we've I wouldn't say that we've binned anything. I suppose the team, yeah, a little bit of screenings had to happen for the 16s, as um, Matt mentioned there. I think the big thing about it as well is it takes, you know, you know, there's only myself and another member of staff um, in the gym with 20 players some days. And we do sometimes do, you know, we might want to get some, uh, we might microdose some testing during pre-training with the force platform, et cetera. But as soon as that member of staff's away doing that testing, you're then not able to engage and coach all the rest of the players in there. And that's the most important thing. So the same as what Matt's saying about, you know, ultimately, it, it takes you away from the most important thing is making sure that the exercises are being done well, they're being cued well, they're done with the right intent. And that's the same with the warm ups that we're talking about. You know, you can put on those warm ups, but if they're not doing it with the intent, then they're wasting their time. But that's our job to get the buy in. They have to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And I just feel that's the whole human side of it all, where I know Matt's mentioning there around data analysts and all the rest of it, and it's fantastic. But the most important thing is being able to get, well, having relationships with players and coaches. So I heard it a million times before. The coach isn't liking you or what you're saying. You're going to have absolutely no impact. It'll be, yeah, you get your 10 minutes over there. I don't want to see it. don't want to know about it. And you can have 10 minutes, that's it. But if you've got a really strong relationship, then you're part of the whole process. And it's the same with the players, the pre-training. Those conversations should be happening all the time. Um, and we've just got to be careful gone off topic a little bit here I'm afraid but no no no, it's cool carry on yeah that you know our our academy and I've heard Nick Cox I think it isn't Manchester United talk about trying to have a lean staff as well and I know at at Tottenham Hotspur that was the the case for a long time um so you've got quality and then you a message doesn't get diluted I think that's absolutely spot on but then that means that you can't 
provide the same level of maybe data analysis all the time. And you may not be able to take every player in their offbeat condition in one-to-one with a, a live heart rate belt, giving them feedback because you haven't got all that stuff. But, you know, you need to give some ownership to the player as well. And ultimately, I think if if we are reducing the staff down, which I agree to an ex- a little bit, so it's still manageable, it's still right. You know, I'm not um, crying that we haven't got enough staff. <laughs> but it just means that you're having to make sure that what you're doing, you're having to be selective in what you do. And that everything you're doing is for the correct purpose and it allows you as much contact time with the players before training, during training, after training and with the coaching staff rather than being sat on a laptop looking at multiple metrics which may or may not have a little bit of impact on their development. Do you think that is one positive of COVID, Jack, that things may be tightened up a little bit budget-wise for staffing and and things do have to lean up, even the ones that the clubs that have got a little bit excited now? Yeah, I wouldn't want to say that. I think, you know, there's lots and lots of clubs out there who yeah. sure could do with more staff. Yeah. So, you know, we're very fortunate to be working here. Um, I don't think that should be the case, but it's probably always good to re re-eva- just to reevaluate departments and just to bring everybody to step back and reflect and say, you know, what is the most, in- the big rocks, what is the most important thing? Let's really focus on that and everything else yeah okay if i get time maybe my own personal time or i've got a real desire interest then yeah but let's just really concentrate on the things that we feel are going to help the players the best and build the relationship with the coaches the players so we can have as much impact um as possible mm-hmm. cool thanks mate just coming to you perry i think it's one of the questions that potentially came in a little bit around training focus variation across the age groups and how, how that differs from the, do you have, are you under nines? Is that yeah. the youngest? Okay, so from under nines up up until, um, yeah, I guess under under 18s, under 23s, and how that training variation changes based on age group. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and again, you look at the bigger picture and you look at under nines through to under 23s as, as part of the academy. And, you know, if you look at some of the, the, the models from the sports participation to the LTAD to uh, Lloyd and Oliver, you know, they're all they're all got their own spin on long-term athletic development or, or sports participation but I think you know some of the principles are transferable so you look at you know they, they all go from highly generic to highly specialized they go from more of an, a, an exposure and a volume base to a higher intensity they go unstructured to structured you go you know purposeful play to purposeful or deliberate performance so you know you you know if you were to you know zoom out they're the two ends of the spectrum and I think um, when you look at the variation, I think you don't just look at the activities you're doing, you look at how you're coaching it as well. So, for example, if, you know, um, I, I'm still a big believer, you know, you have an objective, whether they're under nine or they're under 23, that you've got an objective for the, the athletic development block or the warm up or whatever you want to call it within your club. Um, and, and how you dress that up will look different. So for an under nine, it might be um, frog jumps for you know squat into a into a jump and obviously as they get older it might be an overhead squat with a dow and then they're doing a back squat as they get older or whatever it may be you know you dress it up if they're doing marches and then you're playing a game where they've got to get north south east west versus you're doing max sprints at you know or, or, or high speed exposures at 15 16 or whatever it may be so I think if you follow those principles that I mentioned just previously then I think that you're on the right lines and I think that it should look you know a lot more chaotic and fun and playful the younger the age groups and as you go through a little bit more purposeful a little bit more prescribed um, and then as you get older then you become highly specialized and then you sort of the whole performance element of the periodization of the the rest the recovery um, you know whether you're micro dosing what does the meso cycle look like so it becomes a lot more in depth but that would be sort of a you know a very sort of top level look at how you would you know you'd, you'd integrate the variation across the an academy setup from my opinion how much emphasis does play have yes it obviously is included early doors in that in that pathway does that still have a thread as you go up and get older with 15s 16s 18s and if so does that make people a little bit nervous in terms of how we objectify its impact on a program? We've talked about technology and people's desire for, for numbers. This person's gone from here to here. 
Mm. But maybe with the more unstructured sessions, that becomes a little more difficult. Yeah, I think, um, but I think that they may look unstructured, but I think they are highly planned. Okay. And they're highly periodized. So every every session should, like I say, have the objective, should have the big rocks, but it's how you dress it up. You know, so for example, yes, there would still be a, a fun element or, or a game-based element as you get older, 15, 16s even. If you're doing, if you want to get, you know, uh, max speeds or you want to do that, you might very well do a chasing game for, uh, as an example, right? So they, 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 it's competitive, so they love it. Um, but yeah, I, I can guarantee you that if I've said to the coach, you know, what certain numbers I might get in my block, I can almost guarantee it. But you dress it up in a way that, yeah, they do engage. You know, asking a 15-year-old to go from A to B as fast as he can, yeah, you might get 75% of them that do it. And the other, you know, they might not. So I think, you know, you have to you have to thread it in because you've got to remember as well is these kids are in a highly structured environment. Now, regardless of how you dress up your session, they're in a highly structured environment where they're told where to be at what time to be wearing the same thing. So if we can inject a little bit of fun, a little bit of competition and... Um, playfulness into the session and i think that you know it's it's our job to do that as long as we're hitting those big rocks consistently and we've got an objective that we that we achieve within the session that we're delivering oh thanks mate just moving on to the next point and i'm going to come to um oh my God, coming back to you perry <laughs> managing the periods of rapid growth and maturation and feel free to jack matt dive in whenever you uh whenever you want and this was from kirk uh, when upon registration, putting this um, putting this question in, and there was quite a few questions that I kind of amalgamated into this this one. How do you manage periods of rapid growth and maturation at, at Arsenal? I think the, the first point to manage in any situation is you have to be able to assess it, right? So, and this is not new to anyone, but you know, ass assessing um, growth and maturation are slightly different. Growth being, you know, um, the stature and maturation being more. Um, well, obviously, we use sort of somatic type assessments, right? So we use uh, Karmas Roach. And then what you what we need to do is we, we need to be um, really aware of that we're reporting it in, in a meaningful way. So, you know, I'm sure we've all, you know, I, I know we've all been on the same journey where we've gone, right, growth and maturation is really important. OK, let's, let's, let's measure it. And then we've gone, right, we've got all this data or we've got these measurements. What does it mean? How is it, how is it impactful? And then, you know, over time, we've come to the realisation, you've probably done a bit of a full circle. And we've gone, well, actually, we probably don't need to act on the data it, purely on data's sake. Um, it's probably feeding, feeding into what Matt and Jack were saying earlier, the data we shouldn't, you know, shouldn't be dictate everything we do. So, I mean, we have a sort of a, a, you know, the triple threat for us would be, are they approaching or circa PHV? Are they growing above 7.2 centimetres in a year? And then probably the most important one, are they symptomatic or showing signs of any growth-related injuries? So if you've, if you've got the, the trifecta, then yes, we're going we're gonna to actively um, manage you or modify you. But we, we've also got to remember that, you know, the, 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 the high rates of growth and, and different stages of maturation will affect different players in different ways. So you could have a player that has the trifecta, but isn't actually, doesn't need to be modified that much. Um, equally, you know, you, you might have someone that doesn't have all three, but still needs to be managed in a slightly different way. They might be post, but they still have symptoms and that a high growth rate, for example. And then it's about managing the player because, you know, the, the nature and the sites of the injury, what we can do is we can, um, we can manage it so that they can stay on the pitch. So if we modify the session, the likelihood is they've got opportunities to stay on the pitch as opposed to dragging them off like, you know, the older age groups that have uh, muscle and tendon ligament, you know, issues that, yeah, obviously they need to be offloaded and they need, they need time to recover. Growth related injuries are slightly different. And certainly my, my experience with working with the physios is we can be a little bit more um, proactive in, yes, look, they've got this, this issue, this growth related issue at the moment, but actually we can modify it by not allowing him to do two consecutive days training or by uh, reducing his match minutes or um, by not doing any knee dominant exercises in the gym or giving him a separate program. So I think it needs to be highly individualized. We need to obviously assess, we need to report it in a meaningful way that the coaches understand. And, and also what's really important, I think is, is letting them know what are the implications of, of this stage of, of growth um, you know, adolescent awkwardness being one. So is it going to affect their technical performance? Are they likely to get over it and come back to a certain um, standard? 
Um, you know, so from a talent ID point of view, if someone's more mature, likely to be physically more advanced and then outperform other players. Um, you look at it from an injury perspective as well. You've, you know, you, you get different types of injuries at different sites through different stages of maturation. So can we be proactive in mitigating those risks? Um, so I think from a, from a, even, and obviously, you know, you look at Lloyd and Oliver's work and, and the and rest of the great guys that talk about, you know, the different stages of, and what we should be doing from a strength and conditioning point of view. So there's so many implications and it's about relaying the information to the right stakeholder in the right way, in a, in a meaningful way. And that was a lot of blur there. So no, no, it's great. No, no, don't be silly. Don't be silly. Matt, anything to add? Uh, I think if you asked me the question, the same question 10 years ago, I'd have given you an unbelievably scientific answer on how much we reduce by 10% and, uh, you know, we make them bounce players or we make them floaters and we, you know, we reduce everything by a certain percentage. And in the gym, we do exactly this. And I think it's really important that, and it's the worst answer you can really give of like, it is individual and it, it has to be taken individual. So what, why would I stunt somebody's development in strength, in power, in technical, in whatever it is, just because they're going through a growth spurt. I don't think for how this could last for six to 12 months. So why would I stop this lad developing, um, you know, for just because he's going through rapid growth. So even if a lad has an issue with it or, or symptoms or whatever you want to call it, um, I kind of see it like a graphic equalizer where in all four corners and different areas as well, we always have to be developing in every area, but it just means that sometimes during their development, kind of different faders go up and different faders come down. Um, and so if a lad is symptomatic and he can't train as long or as hard or whatever it is, it's like, well, what you've got to have a, an environment that is a, what can they do environment? You know what I mean? If, you, if you're a parent, you're dropping your kid off, you, you've cut, you left work early, sacrificed some salary for it. So he can come to, to Tottenham or to wherever he is. Um, and he sits there with an ice pack on his knee and then comes back home or he's done some releases or whatever it is and, and got back into the car, hasn't got any sweat on his kit and, and, um, and hasn't really done a hell of a lot. I, th I think, well, is that a true use of his time? You know, I think it's so, so what I'm getting at is uh, it is all individual, unfortunately. Like I think everything has its own case. I think some of it isn't seen um, just because it's measured or it, just because the data says that there isn't an issue doesn't mean that there isn't. So sometimes the coach can be the best eye. I've all heard about the coach's eye and all, all things like that. And the eye of you watching training, I think it's, it's, it's massive, you know, and you, you know something's not right when you see it. You know he's not moving right. You know he's not performing well or whatever it is. And I think that's then where the experience in the building has to come in. And the lads aren't quantifiable robots, you know, they, we can't get a number on everything. And I think some of the stuff that when you edit training or uh, edit your gym session, it, unfortunately, it's a, a lot of it's on feel, you know, a lot of it's on feel and just like how that lad is and knowing what he's normally like and what, what, what's he like now. Okay. Well, sometimes the lad's going through rapid growth and you can put your foot down the accelerator a little bit and, and push him on, you know, and the, and the opposite is like, well, actually, is this an opportunity where we can really get some gains in this? Um, and so I think we can't view, because I think whenever you get into academy football or, or a youth development, your first thing is, all right, I need to know everything about PHV. And so you look through everything you can, and you're like, well, I don't really know what to do with it. Because the, all research kind of conflicts. It's because it's so individual. And I think um, that you have to build up the years of experience, but also use the experience of the people around you that may have seen it and, and lived it and, and got so many different case studies of examples um, to truly be able to act on each case. Sometimes you get it wrong. Of course we get it wrong, but we can't get it right by not wanting to push boundaries and, and improve people. You know what I mean? And so I think that that's, that's kind of key and um, it's the way I kind of see it. Jack, anything to add from your perspective? Yeah, only a little bit. The guys have covered it, really. I think, um, yeah, you've got to be progressive, absolutely. You know, a lot of talk in there. And it actually annoys me about this whole sports science being limited because that's certainly not um, it's not how we work. And I don't know any coaches 
fitness coaches that you know I talk to on a regular basis that are like that. I think maybe just there's a lot of you know noise and around injury models, etc. But that's another that's another story. I think what he's talking about there in terms of observing the training is massive. So from the coach using the eye, so all of a sudden have they lost their basic technical ability? You know, not not completely, but they look out of sorts. And the same in the gym. And then again, that's that communication with the coach. Um, making them aware of what to look for as well a little bit um and there was one other thing that's escaped me i think you know oh, just sorry, sorry 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 uh just <laughs> the thing was to work back from the game so that's always something so you will get players who do struggle um to tolerate load training load you know and you can't say oh he you know people criticize and say you can't say day on day off but actually when you've worked with that player for a year and you know he can't tolerate load, that is the right thing to do. So, you know, you're not being a limiter, you're just doing the right thing at the end of the day, but you're working back from the game. So if the biggest development um, for that child is to play in a high quality game against good opposition, then the training program preceding that needs to be adapted so that he gets as many minutes in that game as possible. So again, that's just where the joint up thinking comes, sharing of information, planning in advance, especially with that age group. There's so many tournaments. All of a sudden, under-15s are playing up in 16s, 14s are playing up in 15s, so they're fulfilling their fixture plus another fixture. So it's just about looking at what's to come as well and really managing those um, training and match schedules. Sorry. Sorry, you're right. I was, Go on, all I was going to say was uh, that I agree the coach's eye is going to be is, is incredibly important, but then it's the role of the MDT as well. So... I think, you know, if a coach says he's off, he's technically, you know, worse than he was last month for the, and you've got the data to hand to go, well, actually, now you mention it, he's growing at X. And then it gives them that, um, gives that player a bit, of, a bit of leeway, a bit of compensation. So I think that, yes, coach's eye is important, but without the data, you can't then back up what the coach is saying to you because it could just be an off day for him. But if you can, if you can, you know, with a, with a solid rationale say, well, actually, look, is at this stage, he's growing at this rate, you're seeing this, the physio is saying that, um, you know, whatever it may be, then I think the role of the MDT to manage, because it is a very vulnerable stage and it, it is vulnerable to varying degrees for the different players. So it's the role of the MDT really, including the coach and, and, and everyone else involved, to then help manage the player if needed. And if it's not needed, fantastic. And they sort of go, on, go along as... As, uh, as, as we all planned and would like to see, but there are cases that do need um, intervention. And a question on the back of that from Lloyd, which came in um, previous, performance markers assessing more regularly during this during this time, apart from the Caris Roach that you mentioned earlier, Perry? No, um, I think four times a year. I mean, we did go through a stage of we were doing it four times a year. And if you were the, those two out of the three that I mentioned, if you were above 7.2 and you were approaching or circa, then we would do those measurements more regularly. So we might do it every six to eight weeks just to see at what stage you were in. And then that would be highlighted at the beginning of the week. So the coach just say, look, we're not, we're not suggesting anything, not suggesting any modifications. Just be aware that this is where we're at with these players. Um, so we did that for a while. Um, and I suppose, you know, what we do is we do sort of movement screens at the beginning of the year. We try and do them again in, say, January time. OK, so with, with, uh, we're any sort of baseline pre-season screening. We do that from, say, definitely 13s to 16s. And if we've got the resources, we do it down to 12s as well. But what we found really works well um, previously is, let's say, you know, and this, this isn't a growth and maturation thing, by the way, but if you've got a 13 year old that's growing really rapidly and he's, you know, he's, he's tight here and he's, he's lost stability there, then, you know, you give them individual, call them whatever you call them, Matt at Spurs, you know, we call them prehab or you might call them injury prevention or you might call them, you know, pre-training programs, whatever it may be. And it might just be a mobility, stability stuff. So the stuff that the guys were saying that they give us homework, we used to do as pre-training, but that is, that's a marker I think that will help mitigate risk or will help players manage that vulnerable physical uh, period in their life whereby you know if we can if we can individualize sites that need to be more mobile and more stable um, then I think that that helps that player as an individual so yeah the answer is no we don't do any more we do the heights and weights and we do that four times a year potentially a little bit more frequently if we feel it's necessary 
Um, and um, yeah, we do a, a, a movement screen twice a year and, and update their, their individual program to help sort of manage that, that time, that period of their life. Just going to come to you, Matt, on the movement screen. Do you guys do a movement screen at, at Spurs? If so, can you tell us a bit more about it? What's involved? If not, why not? Uh, yeah, we do FMS. So um, I know it's gone through the ringer a little bit over recent <laughs> years, but to be honest, it, it underpins everything that I believe um, in SNC should be, really. I know I said about doing mobility and stuff at home, but we, we still see it as a key ingredient to what we do. We might not do it by the side of a pitch, you know what I mean? But um, but programming and everything that underpins our model. Um, so yeah, we, we do our FMS. We've got a couple of screens that kind of link to that or tests that kind of confirm where issues might be. And then uh, 13s plus all get individualized programs for that. Um, I think the, the FMS is all about symmetry. If I then build movement development on top of that, which is uh, our, in, in our methodology as well, like we, we have a kind of a lighthouse model. Um, basically just to relate parents, players, coaches, so that they can see purpose in every, every bit that we do. Um, so in the kind of next level up in our foundations of movement development. And uh, because FMS is largely about looking for asymmetries, like we, we want, or our academy manager, for, uh, first and foremost, wants symmetrical players that, are, um, that can kick the ball the same off the left side as their right side. They can turn the same off the left as off the right. So, you know, why would we not underpin our model with the same kind of attributes and then be able to put movement on top of that? And so as long as that movement can then always link back at all times to the game and their game, ideally, then you can kind of build on top of that. And then we, we kind of build strength and everything um, on top of such movement, which is a kind of that that's it, it's such a, it's, it's so simple, but in a, as a movement screen, we do it similar. We do it three times a year, uh, start of the season, Christmas and end of season. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it, I think it's a great way to individualize what you do and, um, and to kind of build the foundation to build kind of assets upon, you know, We'll come back to the individualization in a minute, Matt. Just okay. want to get Jack's thoughts on movement screens and whether they're integrated at Liverpool if ages. Um, yeah, we do we okay. do the FMS. We do a modified one really. We um it's not massively about the scoring. And again, yeah, we do look at asymmetries, but it's more just based around can they absorb force? in a single leg movement, a dynamic single leg movement. We, you know, we'll do a single leg squat off a box. We'll do a, a, a linear hop and hold. Um, active straight leg raise, we feel there is some, certainly some benefit from that, but it's all in, it's all alongside the physios doing muscle length scores as well on the bed, which I really appreciate that information. Um, and I think we can then, you know, we're, we're fortunate with the 23s that we do have enough time to get them in the gym for the mobility, flexibility work. And I feel like one of the things um, the guys at the first team are really big on is maybe not all, I don't know, say everyone, but like they, if, if someone's got an overactive um, muscle or uh, tend to have like a, a deficiency, when that player becomes, you know, stressed by having increased load, a lot of games, et cetera, then you see that movement dysfunction maybe become slightly worse and therefore you know to really target that area and it's almost like trying to get your body back in balance so we do place um, quite a bit of emphasis on trying to correct back to their norm now you know there is obviously debate as to whether you're really going to improve them from where they are but certainly if you can bring them back to what they normally are and they're not going worse than what they were going onto the pitch in a fatigued state I think that's a massive injury prevention um, method. Um, and yeah, it's good to see. I think one of the things we noticed actually when players came back and Connell Murters, the first team fitness coach, who's really looked into this information, um, when they came back from COVID, a lot of them, a lot of their dysfunction actually cleared up because they weren't playing football, striking lots of balls, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so it's something that I think does, it, it can transient you know it will, it will change over time so it's, it's nice to just stay on top of as a general um 
it can help individualize their pre-training program a little bit as well. You know, it's like if you've got 20 players, you're not going to do all 20 players, but you're going to have three who maybe you know that if they lose a bit of range in a hamstring or an ankle, that's a red flag. And, you know, you can easily do a little, they won't maybe go and report that to the physiotherapist. You can just by getting them to do a little bit of movement in the gym, you can observe that just regular, what they call it, um, invisible testing, you know, just w within your pre-training and, then, you know, as well, I think it's massive because the player then understands that whatever you're providing is bespoke to them as well. So, you know, you might have had some power work put into their pre-training program, but if this is indicating they've got some form of fatigue, then, you know, you're actually going to put an extra a couple of release or mobility exercises uh, or strengthening exercises on the other side sort of thing. So, um, long answer, yes, we do do the screen but we don't take a total score or anything like that. It's very much just um, how can we individualize their, their training program and stay on top of, I guess, what's their movement, that, what's good for them. Cool. Thanks, mate. Just a bit of a reminder to people, if you've got any questions, pop it in the chat or the, uh, or the Q&A and we'll get to it. But I want to finish off and I'm going to get everyone's take on this, but I'll come to Matt first. And this is, this is what the industry obsession at the minute, which is training speed. So I'm just going to get come to you first, as I mentioned, Matt, and how you guys tackle it at Spurs. And is it is it reflected in the industry's obsession with how much emphasis you put on it in the academy training speed? Um, so we we put a lot of emphasis on it. Of course we do. So uh, the the what we obviously have to look at is we're preparing lads for tomorrow's Premier League, not for today's. So. It's getting faster and faster and faster. So, of course, linear speed and everything is, is, is really important. And we need to be thinking ahead rather than what, what we're seeing on a Saturday afternoon. Um, the biggest thing that I've kind of, uh, and the way that I develop speed here, um, and it's obviously, it's not necessarily just about straight line, is all of our sessions link. So, if I'm in a movement development session um, and my theme out on the pitch is 10 meter speed. Uh, I'm going to be doing acceleration mechanics in that session. I'm going to link it to the speed session they did the previous week. I'll put their speed session on the on the screen. I might give a few examples of speed within the game on what we're trying to get out of and, and trying to bring the outside inside as much as we can. So that's in a movement development session. If I'm in a power session and yeah, my, my theme outside is going to be 10 meters, then my my plyos and everything I'm, I'm going to be prescribing in group sessions would be non-counter movement theme to kind of match an acceleration or starting strength theme there. If I'm in a strength session, so our group programming, we'll have a tempo that has a two second isometric at the bottom or amortization phase, however you want to term it, um, to, to match the pattern, you know, of going from nothing to everything and starting strength but also all of our sessions to have a kind of a theme of a horizontal emphasis as opposed to a vertical, because that's essentially what we're trying to get. We're trying to get, you know, um, yeah, we, we're naught to 10 meters. So we build that and then we build 15, then we build 20, then we build 25 and so on. And so I try and get all of our sessions to match. Um, it obviously builds buy into the, with the players because you've always got a reference point that you can link to regardless of what session you're in, you can always link it to what they're going to do on the pitch that week or the week before, how it progresses, how it regresses, whatever it is. Um, so that's the kind of horsepower, you could say, like what we what we train there. With the older age groups, we're also training top speed. So the way I kind of term it to the to the lads with the, yeah, with the 23s is our Tuesdays with our speed drill, let's say 20 metres, it's about horsepower. It's about our, so I drive a, a um, not as good of a car as, as they do. And um, so I'm like, right, I'm, you're the person who beats me off the lights, but half a mile down the road, I'll overtake you. And so now on the Wednesday, we're, we're, we're hitting max speed. And so that's kind of taking the, the uh, and trying to um, separate it a little bit. But essentially, like throughout the age groups, the way we try and do it is have our, with our periodization of July to Christmas and then January to May, to be a, um, a cycle really of all of these uh, these speed zones or however you want or distances, but also the themes that go with it. 
So from non-counter movement theme in power to elasticity in power. And we, we do that all the way through to Christmas. And then we, we almost like a typewriter start again, January to May, we do it again. So 14s, 15s, 16s, 17s, 18s, we, we cycle it. We cycle it two times a year. And so by the time they're at the end of under 18, then we do the maths, they've probably got 10 cycles under their, under their, their belt of good quality speed and agility and power work that I know whenever they do whatever step they're in, in their speed drill, whether it be their 10th step or their second step, I know they're doing it with good quality that links from outside to inside. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of uh, gives you an overview of kind of, uh, yeah, the, the way I see it and the way I've got my, me and my department doing it over the years. Uh, are there other different, other different ways? Of course there is. But I, I believe to make a truly robust player that's physically outstanding, that, that's the best way to do it. But then what I would also caveat that with is our academy manager again wants agile. He, uh, I said, it recently changed this season. So, right, what, what, do you want, what do you want out of your players physically? What do you want to look like? And he said, agile and strong. I, lo I love seeing strong players, uh, uh, strong and agile players. They're, they're, they're my two. And so that we have to take that into account, you know. So our speed drills aren't necessarily just a jelly jaw and running down in a track, you know what I mean? And, and sagittal plane, well, you know, our speed drills have to take that into account. Um, we need to apply stuff in the gym that matches that and develops that. If there's a bit of research out there that shows single leg is better than double leg and building agility and in, in, uh, team sport players. Well, fantastic. I'm all on board with that because that that's, that's the, that's the spec what I've been given by the boss, you know, and over the years, what we've found, I've gone on an absolute tangent here, by the way. So all right. over, over the years, what we've found that's come through this club, um, is exactly that agile players. They're the ones that stand out on our, on our testing, our performance testing through, through the age groups and, so that, that has to have a have a, a focus as well as just straight line speed. I like to think our program is a little bit different to others um, because we not we don't necessarily truly hammer sagittal plane S and C. We of course we include it, but I'm massive on including all other planes and how we can get that little bit of benefit from platform flywheels and wall base flywheels and and all that kind of stuff as well and circular strength with mace bells and kettlebells and all sorts of stuff that kind of bring a different dimension to a multi kind of multi-direction sport perry coming to you then i'll come to jack in a second on the, on the speed stuff anything to add and anything different no, no different to that it's actually it's actually quite nice to to affirm you know uh, across across different clubs as well but yeah very similar and even across the age groups you know it's almost like you know what you were saying matt about the prep work and then finishing up with what you're doing and making sure that you know, if it's a sagittal based session, then you know that your mobilization, your 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 plyos, your the type of plyos you're doing, then link to that, and then cycling it round. We probably wouldn't do two cycles; we might do more than that, um, just so we wouldn't necessarily saturate them in it. We'd touch upon it numerous times, and these are the younger age groups. So then I go back to my previous point right at the beginning, which is if we can do it frequently more frequently than over the seasons like matches alluded to, then you've got numerous, numerous cycles and, and exposures to different, uh, different speeds. The only thing I'd probably add to that is, you know, when we do speed testing and I'm sure everyone that works in football clubs would have heard it, that a coach will tell you someone's fast and you go, well, actually it's that normative data is, is pretty slow or vice versa. So again, it, it becomes, a, it, then, you know, you've got to then say, well, okay, he can run fast, but he reacts slow. So then do we give them enough opportunity to, use that raw material that they've got in contextual drills. So one of the things that we do at the older age groups is then we introduce at the end of the warm up a contextual extensive drill that then allows them to time their run. We give them the opportunity to do the extensive distances, but we, you give them the opportunity to hit high speeds. It might not be max speed, but depending on the, on the pass or, or the, or the, the, the you know, position of the pitch, but it's then about giving them that opportunity to react to the environment as well as just doing that straight line speed. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's it. That that's been new for us over the last season or two, where we've we've added that contextual element to then sort of counter that that argument we always have with speed testing of oh well, they're fast or they're not. But okay, well they can run fast but they react slow, or they react fast but they run slow. So then, what's the emphasis for that individual? 
And then how can we individualise it for that individual? If, they, if they're reacting fast and they look fast on the pitch, but they their speed scores are low, well, actually, that's a, that's an easier win for an s coach, in my opinion. The other one's slightly, you know, a little bit more complex. The ecological dynamics of that play a huge part in that. But yeah, yeah, very similar. Just like I say, the the added the added um, layer of we're trying to layer it at the younger age groups with the contextual drills as well to allow them that opportunity to react. Jack, anything markedly different from these guys? Yeah, a little bit different. Yeah, so 13s, 14s, 15s, 16s is similar, like blocks. Um, obviously, 13s, 14s, sort 14s really sort of get introduced a bit more into the mechanics. Once they get to 18s, certainly 23s, we follow you know different physical um, demands on a on a microcycle. So on a minus three would be your extensive day, bigger errors, etc. So that would be when we then tailor the pre-training to a max velocity sort of elastic um, power sort of emphasis. And with the 23s, I'll always do runways. And it's really good, you know, we'll get max velocity feedback through the GPS. We put that on the group. And to be honest, I don't always ask them to do maximal. I want them all to get above 90%. And I say to them, if you're feeling good, try and get a new max speed. And, you know, probably half of the group will go for it. and. Um, you know, we'll get 101%, you know, every, every now and again, or like only small little gains, but it's, it's good. But pre-training as well will look like uh, there's quite a lot of running sort of drills in there. So guy with the first team, Jordan Fairclough's doing, a, he's, um, he's a full-time fitness coach, but he's doing a, a master's at um, St. Mary's University, Twickenham. And he's, his background is sprint, he's a sprinter. Um, and he's done like some preliminary um, study looking at the 18s, 23s and using the radar gun and ran some correlation um, analysis alongside power and strength scores and actually found that there wasn't, wasn't great strength in the correlations. It actually acceleration technique and max velocity technique in terms of the rate in which players switch their limbs was the most, um, was, was most related to performance. So we're already doing work in pre-training. We've got things like a uh, tank, which is the opposite of a sled on wheels where, you know, but some players who, you know, in the past, when you, you listen to people, it's always, oh, more force, more force, more force. Actually, what we found was that they, their relative force was, was good. They just spent too long on the floor. But it was more of a conscious, it was too slow in terms of driving their knee through. So we've been doing a lot of work on that. Um, some of that's just with resistance bands, um, just a lot of a lot of work there, um, sleds, um, and then as Matt said, really good stuff all about the plyometrics, etc. Massively into that. I think on the minus two session, we'll have more of a reactive sort of agility and acceleration emphasis. Um, yeah, I, I don't do specific blocks. I think all, all I'd say is training should always be. 100% intensity, like every drill. So although, yeah, you're not going to be fresh all the time, I do think that if the football, again, is done right, we get it within the warm-ups, don't get me wrong, but I also believe there's ample opportunities. And what the good thing about having those warm-ups is as well, the things that you relate back, so you, you, you're filming the guys, we can show the video footage of what they might need to do. So whether it is they've got lazy feet, they need to keep their feet slightly more um, dorsiflexed, then you can re you can then get them to work on that within the warm ups as well. Um, so I found that to be really beneficial. Um, and also the thing about the hand, you know, the the runway is as everyone's well aware. Hot topic again is just from that injury prevention. You know, getting a stimulus for the hamstrings as well. So that's how it's tended to be with us. Cool. Thanks, mate. Did you were you going to add anything there, Matt? As a last little. Uh... Was yeah, but then I saw the time and I thought you probably won't want me to. No, no, go on. You, you're all right. We can we can squeeze another little one in, then we'll uh, we'll get to the questions. I think I think the biggest one for me is um, that all the lads when they come in, especially the the younger age groups, they uh, they're at the football club because they love kicking a football, and then they they're not there because they love being in the gym and doing stuff. So we the way I kind of term it to my department every not every day, but we're kind of, is, is to every day we are we are the salesman we've got to be a salesman every day for what we do and so if we're going to be working on some sort of running drill or whatever it is in the gym or 
whatever exercise we've got, it needs an intro. It need it, like we do. We've got a tank as well, Jack, and we we use it. Um, we use it every week on our on our power day. Um, but it will always come with context. It will always come with an intro of this is for this. And then we've got things we're always scrolling through the TV screens and always bringing it back to football of like our, our current one is um, uh, dominating, uh, physically dominating the opposition starts in here. So I'm a kind of corny one. I've got, I've got loads of videos of the 23s in there, just, just bursting past people or knocking people out the way or whatever. And it's an amazing what that breeds from that. And lads, they, they really buy into everything. So I think no matter what we're working on, no matter what paper we read that, that gets us the kind of intervention, we have to sell that to who we're doing, uh, to, who we're, um, to who we're delivering it to. And the more you put in competition to that, obviously that then stirs it up even more and you get intent and, and good outcomes from it. But it, it has to keep being linked back to, to football, uh, especially in our environments, in my, in my opinion. Cool. We've got a few minutes and I'm going to, we're going to rack through these couple of questions. Perry, I'm going to come to you with Nathan's question on deceleration. Where does deceleration training fit in the program? Um, yeah, I, I put it on our change of direction day. So I, when I talk, I, I talk a lot with a lot of emphasis on say the nines to 16s, right? So as much as I know how much they do at, at the PDP phase, whereas I know Matt and Jack talk, you know, will know a lot more of, of that end of the spectrum than I would. So, you know, from from a, a, an early youth or a late youth development stage, uh, that goes on our COD day or our change of direction day. Um, and and so when, when we focus on our speed day, that is just, you know, it is, it's is not all sagittal based and there will be some curve linear running and all that type of stuff. But uh, yeah, that goes on our COD day and, and it will be a, in, a, in reaction and it will be a similar process as um, the prep work will be uh, multi-directional, it'll be transverse pain, it'll be frontal pain, it'll be sagittal pain. Then it will go into multi-directional plyometrics and then it will go into sort of the, uh, the, the, the movement mechanics, multi-directional go into some really prescribed type change direction and then go into an open drill and then finish with a contextual drill. So although that sounds like a lot goes into a 10, 12, 15 minute session, it's, it's, you, you know, you, you can rattle through it quite quickly. The mechanics becomes part of the, the pulse razor, the, the pliers are part of the activation, um, you know, that type of thing. So, yeah, I think that, you know, there's a flow that we always try and follow in that, in our warmups. Um, but the deceleration is, is, is hugely important and, and rightly so. Um, so yeah, that, that fits on our on our COD day. Jack, anything to add on the deceleration piece? Yeah, um, similar to what I was saying there with the, you know, work through the same thing. So 13 to 16, yeah, there'll definitely be a place for it. Going into like, the, and there'll be some games to be fun as well at those age groups. But I think once you get to, again, just talking 23, so apologies if this is a, you know, a little bit biased towards that side, but I think, on a minus four and a minus two, you know, minus two will be agility. There's always going to be deceleration in there. So you always cue in certain players to, you know, either they're collapsing at their hips and they're getting too low or something to do with the footwork, whatever it might be. So it, it's not like I'm going to do deceleration from my point of view, but if I'm going to decelerate to a cone, backpedal and go up for a header, I'm going to observe them decelerating every time. But equally, if that's a thing that myself and the coach and it's being identified as something this player needs to work on, and I'm obviously going to have eyes on him. We've already been doing work with him in pre-training, um, you know, for I'm hoping a period of time. And I'm expecting to see what we've been working on in here. And then also, if he's a real key player, I'll also be filming it in 1v1s, in possessions, what's his press and actions like. And then I can show that back. Equally, the analyst will be part of that as well. So rather than doing an open chain deceleration reactive drill, just use the football that's going on. We're already recording it. And then we send the clips to the player and we can sit down with them periodically and say, you know, either this is getting better or it's, it's not sort of thing. We've still got work to do. Sticking with you, Jack. Next question from, from Danny. Uh, principles that guide pre-season planning for the PDP age groups. Yeah, so um, bigger spaces, bigger numbers to begin with. So I try and stay away for the first couple of weeks from anything just... It's difficult sometimes of our squad size. Sometimes the under 23s a lot go on tour with the first team and some 19s go on tournament and we're only left with so many in the squad. So it ends up being an intensive training session, but trying to follow the principles of extensive training as much as possible. So not too much twisting, turning, 
if there is 1v1s, when that's introduced, say it's done not for a 30 second time period, but more of a technical drill, you know, so you beat the player, you then two are out the square, the next two go on sort of thing. Um, likewise, we're shooting, you know, we don't want to be hitting laces early on, uh, but at some point, you know, after a couple of days, you know, we want to be doing side side uh, foot finishing, different types of finishing, not just repeating the same, the same ball strike, but I guess like, you know, the rain behind model in an ideal world, working from bigger numbers. And then as players tolerate, get used to the high intensity actions, they can deal with um, more, a, a greater density of those high intensity actions as well. So this isn't Liverpool Football Club's philosophy. This is just how I see pre-season. Once we get in season, uh, I've, I've much more um, different on different days. So more of a, a strength day, an intensive day, extensive day, then more of a speed slash quality over quantity day. And then your typical sort of reactive minus one training day. Um, cool. Matt, anything to add there? Yeah, I'll throw a disclaimer in there as well. That these are, <laughs> it's all my views, not, not top. <laughs> Terry, over to you in a minute, yeah. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think... Um, trying to find ways that the GPS cut, because the, the GPS itself obviously uh, only gives you an objective number. So what I've tried to do over the years is contextualize it as much as possible. So we, we clip all of our drills into non-reactive and reactive. And I know it's, it's quite basic, but that's how we want it. And so it, early in pre-season, we, we essentially just work through a lot of, of non-reactive drills and kind of build a an engine, build a foundation of fitness using non-reactive things. Because obviously, if I know I'm going to play it to one mannequin and sprint to, sprint to another and stop, that's one XL, one D cell. And if I did a 1v1 against you and you knocked it past me and smacked me in the chest and, uh, you know, tackle me at the end or whatever, that's still one XL, one, one D cell. And so we have to try and contextualize it as much as possible as well. And again, not, not be robotic and kind of look at the GPS and how that progresses that way. I think trying to find ways on um, on contextualizing the load that we give the players as well and drill choice, especially early in pre-season is really important. Another way that we've used um, this season uh, is, is doing exactly what Jack said there. So like with ball striking, essentially uh, this has been obviously the, the biggest season for it because lads went four months without kicking a heavy football, but um, actually grading each session in volume and intensity of ball striking. So if a five in volume, i.e. the number of, and intensity being obviously direction of and power and everything, it, all the sessions in that for each individual. And you'd be surprised just how many injuries and issues and niggles and everything correlate with, with that scale. And it's just like an RPE, like it's my opinion of a session as they come in, that, you know, at volume three, intensity three, it takes me three seconds to do it and, and, and type it in, but building a picture over time, you get a lot from it. And I think it's trying to contextualize that GPS throughout the season, but also in pre-season, um, hitting the right numbers, but but also in that side as well. Cool. Last, <clears throat> excuse me, last point, Jack? Yeah, just a couple of things on that. So um, I think it's important in the off-season that players should all have a football at home and they should uh, start doing some skill sets before they come in. So we'll program you know, some, some videos for them to do, technical work, but then equally I'll also ask them to progressively do a bit of ball striking and do some just self-led 1v1 sort of ball mastery skills. So they're getting used to changing direction, do some in boots as well, so they're not all breaking down with blisters in the first week. I think, you know, just going back to what I said about having smaller numbers, you then need to complement that with, you need to get some extensive work in there. So that will come through running and there's no other way of doing it really unless you just going to do dribble tracks and, and things like that but wherever, wherever the choice is you're going to need to get some um just more sort of unload all the twisting and turning maybe some linear mass running or whatever it might be but then once you get through quite often what happens is you know you see all these pre-season periods and you say okay we're going to hit this volume then we're going to reduce the volume down and increase the intensity but ultimately what happens is you've got lots of games you know so you basically i always feel like your job is to get them fit enough to be able to tolerate 60, 70 minutes in a game, you know, in an ideal world, again, you know, everyone does 45 minutes and you swap over, you swap teams, but that doesn't always happen. But once that happens, then you're, you're working around your games program already. And I think that's right as well. I think, you know, as long as you're not playing every three days, you've got to work out how many numbers you've got. 
but ultimately the game will give you a lot of fitness, but it's about managing them players to make sure that the ones who aren't getting as many minutes, you know, everyone's getting sufficient minutes, basically. So the periodization of the pre-season really depends on, are you going away on tournaments? Um, how big is your squad going to be? Does your manager like isolated running or not? You know, so it's, um depends, as always. Cool, thanks, mate. Right, we've got three minutes, and I'm going to let you get back to it. And Matt, you can leave and, and finally go home. Finally go home. But last thing, uh, tips for people wanting to get into elite academies. I'll come to you, Matt, first. You've got one minute each, thirty seconds each. Oh God. Okay. Um, I think be humble. Don't be afraid of working for free. Whether you go to Tamworth FC or Tottenham Hotspur, it's still um, valuable experience. Speak to the people around it. They're the pe- like to be honest. Sometimes the, the work at Tamworth is more real. It's more raw. You get you know you can you can see things um, up close that, uh, that that you might not know. But also, I think don't be pigeonholed by that one sport either. So my background is uh, before I came to Tottenham, I worked across. 18 different sports in an SNC centre. And I'd probably say I learned so, so much, well, not so much more, but I, I learned so much that I then bought into a football environment and appreciate each individual for, for what they are and, um, and how everybody needs different programming. And I think uh, that, that's the biggest one is be humble. And I think just, just uh, send as many emails as you can. 99% won't get back to you, but um, there, there'll be one that, that, that will and you can go and shadow them. And that's basically what I did. Oh, thanks, mate. Perry? Yeah, you know, I think uh, everyone on this call would have probably been through hundreds of CVs. And I think, um, if, I don't know how many times I've said big rocks in the last hour, but I'll say <laughs> again. But the big rocks of a CV would, would be typically now, and I'm, and I'm not saying it's right, but MSC seems to be the norm. Um, UKSCA would, would probably be up there for me. Bases as well, because um, I think there's we're doing a bit of a dual role now. We've talked a lot about tech and GPS in the last hour. I don't know. We would have. I don't know if we would have done that seven or eight years ago. Um, it's sort of suddenly emerged and been part of our role. So I think you need you need the right quals. But what's really important for me, especially those that I would interview within the youth academy, so anything from sixteen down, would be experience working with youth athletes. Uh, and similar t- to Matt, it doesn't matter if that person has worked for a, a junior netball team, hockey team, um, whether it's been kids parties at the weekend, summer camps. Genuinely, I think you know it's a, it's a it's a really unique skill set to be able to engage um, the different age groups throughout uh, um, the academy as as we currently stand. So, you know, yes, have your big rocks, have 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 what gets you to the gets you to the table, but then inevitably, if you're going to come for an interview at an academy, you're going to have to do a practical at some point, um, presumably. And I think that's that's where you will um, stand out is if you if you've got the skills to engage to um uh, to um to teach to coach different age groups throughout um throughout childhood and adolescence i think that really puts you on a on, on a high footing um so yeah get, get out there and coach youth athletes regardless of what level they're at or what sport they play someone just messaged in saying 13 times you've mentioned big rocks this this really no, I'm, no, I'm joking i'm gonna go joking. Through- <laughs> that was me okay. <laughs> <That's 20. laughs> Jack, last but not least. Please yeah. say the rocks. Um, <laughs> it's basically quite a lot of CVs are the same. You're right. So a lot of people get UKSCA, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're going to have the face-to-face interview, ultimately you need to have some sort of life experience. So, and that, when I say life experience, that just means you've taken yourself into some, you're taking yourself out of your comfort zone. So I remember doing Tottenham Foundation kids, three-year-olds, about 50 of them just running crazy, parents looking at you, kids' parties at David Lloyd. Um, it does, you haven't got to go and coach at an academy in football whilst doing your MSc. You need to go and deal with like uncontrolled kids with people watching you. And to be honest with you, the parents are just happy that they, you've taken them off their hands, but you don't know that at the time. You're panicking and thinking you need to provide something unbelievable. But once you've done that, and then you can hold, when I say live experience as well, you need to be able to hold a conversation with the coach as well. So if you just literally 
gone to university and you haven't gone and worked, just if you go and work in a different, even a different area to an extent, I'm not saying like step out completely, but you need to be able to hold a conversation because coaches tend to be mid thirties, you know, I guess, or older, you know, you don't, you're not getting many 23, 24 year old coaches, which is what fitness sports scientists, you know, fitness coaches coming in and they know nothing really, a lot of them apart from the university and done an internship, you know, downloading heart rate belts and GPS somewhere for a year. You need to somehow do a bit more than that. So what gets you, um, I spoke to somebody else, I'm not going to say the name, at a really big club who um, asked for certain criteria for a job interview. And ultimately the guy who got it didn't really meet any of the criteria, but he was the right person. He's got experience, but he's the right person because he's going to be able to engage with the players and get them to do, he's got the knowledge. He may not have all the qualifications, but he's got the right personality. And that's, that, that's key. And, you know, I guess some people, unfortunately, it's not, it's not for everybody, but then there's probably different jobs within the academy as well. So if you really are passionate about data and you're not going to be great in front of a group of people, that's no problem as well. Like really go into the data, but then obviously there's going to be limited opportunities. There's only going to be so many clubs. So it's just about getting life skills to be able to handle social situations with players from all different cultures, different, you know, family situations, different coaches, different age groups. You'll be able to manage up. You've also got to be able to talk to the nine-year-olds on the pitch in the evenings. So um, that's the biggest thing, not getting a UKSDA, not getting your bases, supervised experience for me. Get them alongside, but the priority is getting that life experience, coaching experience.